Hello all, welcome back to the Codable Universe. If you're new here, my name is Hannah. I'm the instructional designer and coach at Codable. We are working to bring high quality and fun computer science education to every K-5 student. On this channel, we post tons of animated video lessons that teach students coding basics. But today we're gonna do something a little different. This is the first episode of a new series that I will be hosting on this channel, where I hop on here and we chat about questions, concerns, wonderings, or ideas that you have about teaching elementary computer science. Each episode will be a little bit different depending on what you guys are interested in, so I definitely want to hear from you in the comments if you have ideas for topics you'd like to see covered. For example, I might break down a recent article that I find interesting, offer different instructional tips and tricks, share an interview with a teacher, or provide direct resources. The ultimate goal here is to get you the tools that you need to bring all things STEM to your elementary students, regardless of your background or if you have experience with science, technology, engineering, and math for yourself. I am really excited about today's video because we are going to kick it off with one of my most favorite topics that has definitely gotten an overhaul in 2020, and that is makerspaces. In today's video, we're going to go over four tips for creating your first virtual makerspace. Virtual makerspace. If you're excited to learn more and you enjoy this video while you're watching, please be sure to give us a thumbs up and click the subscribe button so you don't miss more videos like this one. All right, enough rambling, let's get into it. So let's start with the basics. What is a makerspace? A makerspace is exactly like it sounds. It is a space in a school or a library, museum, or some other setting where participants can make things. It's a makerspace. Some makerspaces have high-tech tools like 3D printers, laser cutters, soldering tools, uh, sewing machines that participants can use to make things. But it really doesn't need all of these high-tech machines or really any machine for it to be considered a makerspace. If you have cardboard, Legos, tape, art supplies, then you're on your way. You can totally put together a makerspace. It's more about the maker mindset, this idea of creating something out of nothing and getting to choose what you're working on. Those are the things that are at the core definition of a makerspace. In an education setting like a school, makerspaces provide students with the opportunity to create hands-on projects of their choice. So let's talk benefits. There are tons of benefits to teaching in a makerspace. Young children construct their knowledge of the world around them through everyday experiences. They learn by doing, by asking questions and seeking the answers through experimentation. This is why makerspaces are such a powerful educational environment. They provide students with this opportunity to practice the four C's that are so sought after in 21st century schooling. So if you don't know, the four C's are critical thinking, creativity, collaboration, and communication. But beyond the four C's, makerspaces are an awesome learning environment to learn so many other 21st century skills like problem solving and self-confidence. Basically, makerspaces are awesome. It's why I'm so passionate about them. But I know a lot of teachers are unsure how to get started with a makerspace, and especially in 2020, how to move it online. So that's what we're gonna talk about here. Like I mentioned, there are tons of types of makerspaces. Some of them are bananas. So I'll show you some examples. There's Fab Labs, which are like those high-tech makerspaces I was talking about with the 3D printers and the laser cutters. There's arts and crafts-based makerspaces that are a lot more accessible to teachers. So that's probably what you've seen in schools or museums that include hands-on art materials like tape and cardboard where participants can construct and make projects. There's also wood and metal workshops. There's um, hacker, what's, the, what's word? the word? Like hacker spaces where all the making is done via computing. So there's tons of options. My personal experience with makerspaces, I used to work at a children's science and art museum where I would teach camps and classes in an early childhood fab lab. So this was a building that had high tech tools like a 3D printer, some laser cutters, a screen printing contraption in a learning environment meant for kids who were two to 10 years old. So when I hear makerspace, that's what I think of. But in 2020, the makerspace has gotten a total makeover. 
What we have historically associated with makerspaces like hands-on learning, collaboration, those are things that have been a lot more difficult to do safely. It, it's just not accessible right now. So teachers, being the brilliant innovators that they are, have adapted and they've created the virtual makerspace. So how does this work? In a virtual setting, a makerspace is going to look a lot like a choice board. Um, if you haven't seen what a choice board is, these are any web-based platform that students can go to and choose from a collection of activities or projects. Choices could be to read, to go outside, to do a science project, to write, to do art, things like that. Choice boards are awesome because they allow the child to choose what they're interested in and direct their own learning. So a virtual makerspace is going to be pretty similar to a choice board, except all the options that are on the platform ask you to make something. You keep all the same principles that you would in a physical makerspace, but you move it online. Great, it sounds so easy. How do I do that? So I'm no longer teaching, I'm working at Codable full time. So to get inside the mind of a teacher and learn some firsthand tips, we talked to Shannon Miller, who is a district teacher librarian and innovation director of library and technology in Iowa. She works with, get this, 950 students, <laughs> grades pre-K through 12th grade. So you better believe that she knows what she's talking about. I'll link her social media in the description box below so you can check out some of the work that she's doing. She is awesome and she actually has a pre-made virtual makerspace that you can take and change and modify to fit the needs of your class. It's made with Google Slides and I'll link it in the description box below too, but that's available to you right now if you want some sort of jumping off place for the virtual makerspace. I am going to use this example as I go through her tips for creating one yourself. So here is her makerspace. And now let's talk about Shannon's four tips for creating your own virtual makerspace. Step one, think carefully about how the activities are organized. It's great if the makerspace is inviting and interesting to look at, but more importantly, it has to be easy to understand. So you can see in Shannon's example, she organizes all the projects and activities by subject. This makes a lot of sense to me because whether she has a kindergartner or a 12th grader accessing this makerspace, most kids organize their school day by the different subjects or classes that they are going to. So in a virtual makerspace, if the activities are organized that way, it'll make sense to the student. It seems like such an easy tip, but it makes a huge difference. If kids understand how the makerspace is laid out and organized, they're not gonna waste time trying to figure out the format and what each column means. They're going to be able to go straight to the activity and the subject matter that they're interested in and not waste time trying just trying to figure out what they're looking at. Step two, you'll want to include things that students are familiar with, but also some new things. So what this means is when your kids first look at the virtual makerspace, it might feel really new to them if this is something that you haven't done a lot in the past. They're going to want to see topics, subjects, or activities that they've seen before to kind of ease them a little bit, to help them realize that this doesn't need to be like a scary, scary shift or anything, that there's things there that they know that they will be successful doing. That said, you don't only want the content matter in your virtual makerspace to be the kids have already done or mastered in the past. The incredible thing about makerspaces is that it allows kids to learn by doing, like we mentioned earlier, it allows them to learn through experimentation. And if they've already mastered a bunch of content, there isn't that much to gain in the virtual makerspace by redoing that same content, which is why Shannon recommends adding some new topics in there, some new activities that maybe they've never seen before, even new subject matter, to see if they choose to experiment. And if they do, then there's a lot of learning opportunities there. For example, Shannon shared that a lot of the teachers that she has worked with include coding as an option in their virtual makerspaces. Coding is something that is not taught in every school, but has a big impact in helping students develop creative problem solving skills, resilience, and logical reasoning. So yeah, don't be afraid to include topics that might be brand new to your students because that's how they'll learn the most. Step three, keep it fresh. As we mentioned, you want the content in your makerspace to be organized in a way that's easy to understand. 
but you don't want it to get stale. This is actually one of the best things about a virtual makerspace, I think, and is actually a huge benefit over a physical makerspace is that if you created your makerspace online, you can change your offerings all the time. You might realize that one project that you posted is not really popular with your students. They're not excited about it. They're not completing it. Get rid of it. You can switch it up. You can add something else in there to test out if that would work better. It's a way for you to make sure that the content you're providing for students is the best content for them. And also it keeps it interactive and fun and interesting. Uh, your students will log on to their virtual makerspace excited to see something new that they haven't tried before. So as Shannon says, keep it fresh. And step four, this is the step that Shannon says is one of the most important when creating your own virtual makerspace. Listen to your students. You are the expert. You know your students the best. If you listen to what they're interested in, you can tie that into the makerspace offerings. There should be a relationship between your kids and your makerspace curriculum. You can ask yourself, do my students see themselves reflected in these projects? Are these issues that they care about? Are they interesting to them? When my students work on these activities, do they see themselves as powerful change makers in the world? This is one of the reasons why I'm so passionate and why I love coding and computer science as an option in your virtual makerspace, because we've seen it this year more than ever. Technology is changing the world and we do interact with it every single day, especially during virtual learning to offer something like coding and computer science in your virtual makerspace will help kids make a connection between what is going on in their everyday life and what they're learning in school. Even our youngest students can play a role in changing the world when they learn computer science at a young age. So listen to them, what is relevant in their lives and make sure that that is reflected in your makerspace as well. Okay, this is the last thing that I'll talk about before we wrap it up and I, I thought it was really important to include. If you were to Google virtual makerspace or choice boards, or even looking at Shannon's version of her virtual makerspace, looking at any of these examples, they are what I would call Pinterest worthy. This means that they look amazing. They have artistic flourishes, and it's clear that a lot of time went into creating the aesthetic that you actually see when you open the makerspace. Having it be warm and inviting and interesting when you first open it is a huge plus, but I want to make sure that before I wrap this video up, I tell you that it's not required. If you look at these examples and you think to yourself, oh gosh, I am not tech savvy, I'm, I'm not artistic, my makerspace or my choice board that I put together is not going to look like these examples that I see on Pinterest, that is okay. It is much more important, in my opinion, to make sure that the activities that you're linking to are awesome and the aesthetic, how it looks, can come second. Because at the end of the day, our students are going to learn by doing the activities. They're going to learn by clicking the link and following the instructions. They're not going to learn just from looking at the makerspace itself. They have to dive in and do the projects. So that's why I just wanted to emphasize picking the right projects that are relevant for your students' lives over spending a ton of time making sure it looks beautiful. Again, both are important, but don't lose sight of where the learning is happening because we're all new to this. There is no best practices for virtual makerspaces yet because it's all so new. Please do not think that some of the examples that you see online are the template that you must use to create your virtual makerspace. Make it your own. You might have a completely different idea that works a lot better for your students. So I hope that makes sense. That is about it for our first episode of insert the name that I come up with for the series that I haven't thought of yet. If you have any ideas, for what this series could be called, where I offer tips and tricks like this, leave it in the comments below. I'd love to get some perspective from the community that's actually going to be watching these videos. I really hope you found this video helpful. Make sure that you like the video if you enjoyed it and you subscribe to our channel so you don't miss the next one. I'll see you next time. Bye.